introduce Andrea Salamandras of uh, the Holden Redleaf Law Firm, who will be uh, introducing our speaker. Uh, we are now in the 14th year of uh, the partnership between the Caston Centre and Holden Redlick, uh, the Holden Redlick Visiting Fellow Program, which um, is our longest, uh, which is our longest partnership by quite some way, and um, and has been a really a really wonderful partnership for us, and I hope for you, um, especially because we can bring out um, people of the calibre of our speaker tonight. So please welcome Andrew. Thank you, Sarah. It is uh, fantastic that the firm has been able to do it for so long, and yesterday we in fact had the, the pleasure of Professor Michael O'Flaherty uh, speak to us at Holding Redlick, and he gave an incredibly powerful presentation and different, in fact, to what he's speaking about today. So those of us who are from Holding Redlick who got to hear that yesterday have been treated twice in two days. Um, Professor O'Flaherty is, is a Professor of Human Rights Law and has been the Director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights at the National University of Ireland in Galway since February of last year. Previously, he was the Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission until November 2013. From the period 2004 to 2012, he was a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee and in part of that time was the Vice Chairperson. And he has served in many roles in the UN over the last two years. I welcome Professor O'Toole. get to the point quickly here. I was settling back down there. I didn't realize I was going to be here quite so soon. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed uh, for, for coming this evening. I'd like to, to, to thank the firm for sponsoring the fellowship, um, uh, uh, the um, Sarah and everybody at Castan for the wonderful hospitality. Uh, and to say to all of you, what a great pleasure it is to be in Melbourne for my first time. Uh, I have uh, enjoyed the weather very much this week. <laughs> I arrived to a deluge on Sunday, and I literally have lived this four seasons every day about which you speak, and um, uh, thank goodness I got my one summer's day yesterday before I go back to the gloomy northern European winter. Um, so I got, uh, my topic today is to speak to you about issues of LGBTI rights and some international initiatives to address those. And to set the scene for that, if you'll allow, um, if I could just recall, perhaps you haven't been aware of this, just four weeks ago, the, the city of Donetsk in the Ukraine uh, uh, attempted to set itself free from Ukraine, set up some kind of independent autonomous republic, to use some name like that. And what you might ask was the first legislative act of the Donetsk Independent Republic. It was the recriminalization of same-sex sexual activity. Can you imagine it? Uh, they, 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 they secede from their country, and in that long list of the tough issues they're going to have to confront as a new nation, as they see it, uh, well, the, the recriminalization was going to have to be the very first item. Now that piece of idiocy, uh, uh, it, it, it comes to my mind just as does the appalling behavior of the Ugandan government. As reminders, during this year and last year, and indicative of the shocking state, the deplorable state of the uh, violation of and the, uh, the unwillingness to protect the human rights of members of sexual minorities, uh, an unwillingness to protect patterns of violation that are quite astonishing in their breadth, that embrace every imaginable human right, be it civil, political, economic, social, or cultural. Again, just to recall stuff you all know very well, there are still seven countries in the world uh, that impose a death penalty uh, for same-sex sexual activity. There are 78 countries uh, that still have, I suppose it's 79 now with Donetsk, uh, that have criminalization of same-sex sexual activity. And the countries that criminalize uh, 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 homosexuality have a combined population of 2.8 billion people. It's an astonishing number. Uh, there are countries uh, which actively, proactively torture people because of their minority uh, uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, which may not explicitly uh, impose torture themselves, but uh, it deliver appalling uh, fates for people in their care, such as prisoners, by refusing to give them the necessary protection. Um, there are countries that positively encourage the rape of people on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity by refusing to acknowledge uh, that uh, a man 
for example, can be subject to a rape. Uh, uh, rape legislation in a number of countries is only willing to concede that a rape can be perpetrated on or against a woman. Um, the uh, instance of the failure to prosecute homophobic crime across the world is astonishing and disturbing. Uh, and the list could go on and on. As I mentioned, it hits all sectors, all areas of human rights. Uh, and again, just look at patterns of discrimination uh, to see what that means in practice. It's not just about uh, who gets the job. It's also about who gets into the school, who gets to stay in the school, who gets access to social housing, social welfare, uh, right across every dimension of what matters uh, for a decent life. Uh, some of the issues uh, of discrimination violation are very particular uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, the context of gender identity, uh, where the basic entitlement of self-identification, which we recognize across all manner of, of other aspects of life, is, 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 is simply not conceded by very many countries around the world, and even where your self-identification is acknowledged, uh, most enormous complications are added by many states through requirements of surgical procedures, divorce of your partner, uh, and on and on it goes. I won't go much further in terms of talking about human rights abuses other than just to recall uh, briefly the extent to which we also find in human rights abuse on the basis of sexual orientation our gender identity, the phenomenon of what we call intersectionality. In other words, the problem becomes all the more acute when somebody who is vulnerable because they belong to a sexual minority also experiences the vulnerability of, for example, being a refugee, being disabled, being a child, being a prisoner, uh, which greatly compounds uh, the, the dreadful experience. Now, where do these human rights abuses that I've just listed uh, take place? Are they just in the Donetsk's? and the Ugandas of the world? Uh, not at all. Uh, it's very important to acknowledge the extent to which the human rights abuses and intolerance and prejudice and discrimination is a global phenomenon, as much to be found in the developed or the Western world, I can't really call it the Western world in Australia, but you know what I mean, um, uh, uh, but as much an issue there as in any other part of the globe. Uh, the problems I've just listed for, to you, for example, around gender identity are all problems of the developed world. I didn't have to seek long and hard. I looked at the laws of, 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 of many typical European states uh, to, 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 to pinpoint uh, those types of issue. And in terms of violations and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, uh, we got a wake-up call in Europe uh, just a few months ago when the European Union Human Rights Oversight Agency, the Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, produced really quite startling statistics. According to the FRA, 38% uh, of gay people in Europe are never open about their sexual orientation. 38% in the European Union are not willing to be open about uh, their orientation or their relationships. That figure shoots up 67% when the question is asked how many gay children are willing to be open about their sexuality in school. Uh, and 67%, excuse me, say never under any circumstances would they want their sexual orientation disclosed uh, in the school. And finally, uh, they, 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 of these just indicative of few, few figures, 66% of same-sex couples in Europe say they would never be caught holding hands in public. That's a, a significant majority would never be caught showing affection in public. And what does that say to uh, the protection of their rights in what is argued to be one of the most human rights compliant corners uh, of the earth? So we've got a very serious problem. And then we need to ask ourselves, what on earth are we going to do about uh, that problem? Uh, and in that context, you would imagine that one of the first things we would do, the first place to which we would go for um, encouragement and for action would be to international human rights law and practice. There, you would think, is going to be a large part of our solution. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll identify the human rights protections and we'll use those as a template uh, to ensure that people don't have to suffer as they do in so many places. <laughs> but as many of you indeed will know, the curious thing is that the obvious place to which we would go, international human rights law and practice, has proved to be a, a reluctant, a reluctant space in which to protect the rights of sexual minorities. 
uh, in the first place. And this is of no, shouldn't be of any great significance, but it's worth mentioning at the outset. Uh, in the first place, the treaties, the human rights treaties, say nothing about sexual orientation and or gender identity issues. They're silent on this. Now, that shouldn't matter. The treaties don't mention Australians or Irish people either, but we still get ourselves protected, uh, notwithstanding that absence of specific reference to us in our place or in our situation. But to a degree that's disturbing and ridiculous, uh, people oppose uh, uh, protecting the human rights of sexual minorities because of this lack of reference in the treaties. Two years ago, in my work in the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, I was engaged in a dialogue with representatives of a government, uh, and um, it was my job to raise issues around complaints of the abuse of trans people in police holding cells in a certain city. And um, I put my questions, uh, and the, 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 the first effort at a response by the state representative was to say that, last, this is more or less a quote, that last time he checked, he didn't see any mention of trans people in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, suggesting somehow that this meant that they were excluded from protection. Now, in fairness to the country of which this idiot was a representative, uh, his head of delegation very quickly jumped in uh, to say that uh, uh, the man was not necessarily representing the views of that government. But nevertheless, the silence in the treaties has been uh, twisted to present itself as a problem. But nevertheless, some aspects of the protection of members of sexual minorities has, over time, been read into the key relevant international human rights treaties. Uh, the remarkable thing, though, is that it took such a very long time. The European Convention on Human Rights was adopted in 1948, but it was only in 1981 uh, that the Dudgeon case was adopted, that landmark case. Uh, uh, which found a violation of the rights of a gay man on the basis of the criminalization of same-sex sexual activity. And Mr. Dudgeon won more by surprise than by prediction, because there had been a long pattern uh, of these issues being rejected by the court and the European Commission on Human Rights in the preceding years. So eventually, a, 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 a landmark case, but indeed, as I say, after a struggle and a great length of time, and when it comes to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the UN equivalent of the European Convention, it was only in 1994 that the same point was established uh, through that most famous of Australian cases to the UN, uh, Tunin, the Tasmanian case, about which I guess all of you know a lot more than do I. The, um, so a long time in the establishing, we finally get a little bit of progress in 1981 and in 1994, but even then, I have to say, then and for many years to follow, uh, we found only a very narrow, limited, mean space for the protection of sexual minorities in the international human rights treaties, with almost every case centering around issues exclusively of protection of privacy and the prohibition of discrimination. Now, human rights go well beyond privacy and non-discrimination, and yet this was the box into which the issues had to be squeezed uh, by and large. Um, we had, for example, as an example of things not getting into that box, uh, the failure of a case from New Zealand, uh, the Jocelyn case, uh, of an attempt to identify a right of marriage equality. Um, my, come back to that in due course. Uh, but in Europe then, just to be fair in terms of getting the balance right, we did see some progress around issues of uh, transgender and uh, intersex, uh, but these were modest enough given the scale of the problems uh, that confront people in Europe and elsewhere. Um, why, we might ask, was there and has there even until now been such very painful progress uh, in establishing a human rights protective space for sexual minorities. And here I'd like to suggest, or nothing I'm going to say is blindingly original, uh, but it's no harm to draw the threads together. Uh, in the first place, we have to acknowledge the extent of what we might call heteronormativity in our societies. Uh, the heterosexual and all that's associated with heterosexuality is presented as the norm. And almost automatically then, almost by definition, everything else is presented or is imagined as other, as deviant, uh, as off the norm, and somehow to be tolerated rather than to be celebrated. And I think in very large part, this has helped 
keep the box tight within the international legal framework. Uh, closely associated with this heteronormativity has been an unwillingness of champions of human rights over the years, not all, but many, to engage uh, these issues. Um, it's notable, for example, that the inter great international human rights organizations came rather late in the day to issues of the protection of the human rights of sexual minorities. They've well caught up by now, uh, but uh, it, it Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and other of the premier international organizations took quite a while to reach these issues. And uh, I, I would suggest that you can apply that template uh, also at the national level across the world, where the uh, mainstream human rights champions, promoters, and defenders have tended to bypass the issues. Again, as I say, largely in the context of a heteronormative world. Um, with this sidelining or marginalization of the promotion and protection of the rights of sexual minorities has come a sense that actually their rights are different rights. They're LGBT rights or LGBTI rights. And somehow LGBT or LGBTI rights, they're different things to human rights. Um, when I was appointed to the um, role of Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, on one of my very first television, in television interviews in uh, Northern Ireland, I was happily chatting away about human rights. Everything was going really well, I thought. What I didn't realize was that there was a ticker tape playing underneath my image on television. And you know, when you're in the studio, you're not aware of this tape. Yet only the viewer at home sees what's being written about you in that sort of tag uh, under your, 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 your head. Uh, and um, the tag under me was saying, O'Flaherty has been appointed to this issue, and he is a protagonist of gay rights. And I was happy talking about human rights. But all of this was running underneath me as I spoke. And I think it reminded me of the extent to which um, gay rights, as they put it in that, um, in that television tag, were presented as and were set up to be different to human rights and somehow problematic and challenging to my core function, which was to work for human rights. Now, had I seen the tape, I would have had a chance to respond. I only heard about it when my apoplectic staff told me about it after the interview. The, um, and finally, in terms of the problematic, uh, what, why the space has been so narrow for so long, um, the, the differentness of LGBT rights or LGBTI rights or their promotion and protection is sometimes exaggerated or is sometimes distorted, a better word, uh, by, by certain community groups in society as malevolent and not only different to human rights but undermining of society uh, and its values and all the things that are good. And we see that discourse very prominently right now in the work of certain um, uh, Christian evangelical groups uh, uh, operating in particular out of the United States and who've had a very large role to play, for example, in Uganda. Uh, there's a splendid film called God Loves Uganda. If you haven't seen it, get a hold of it. Uh, it, it brings to life this phenomenon uh, very dramatically. And uh, we see it a little bit also in some voices within the Roman Catholic Church, uh, voices for whom I imagine uh, the remarks of the present Pope Pope must be very discomforting because he doesn't fit this narrative uh, of the uh, gay person as the malevolent instrument for the destruction of society. Um, so there we go. That's where we are. That's where international law has constrained itself in a broader social context, such as the one I've suggested. And um, that was the context uh, about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit less. Uh, of a group, uh, uh, a group of human rights types, uh, including myself, gathering together to figure out is there some way we can bring the human rights responses to these issues to some new level? Is there some way we can escape the narrow boxes? And it occurred to us that what we needed to do was to map the experience of what it is to be a member of a sexual minority across the globe. And, and, and as with tracing paper, to place it over the international human rights standards, to demonstrate that the rights of these people are human rights, and every one of these violations on this global map requires a, a human rights law-based response. Uh, and it was that exercise that would become known as the Job Jakarta Principles. Let me tell you a little bit about these Job Jakarta Principles. Uh, they were formulated in a, um, an initiative 
of three international NGOs, maybe making reparation for historical neglect. Uh, one was the International Service for Human Rights, the other was the International Commission of Jurists, and the third was Human Rights Watch. Uh, and they assembled a, a group of us, with me as the rapporteur, our principal drafter, uh, to carry out exactly the exercise that I've just described. Uh, we did that over a period of almost two years, uh, a, a community of 29 experts, uh, some of us specialists in human rights, generalist human rights types, uh, and others who had a long and distinguished background in LGBTI advocacy. Uh, we were two rather disparate communities at, at thrust together in this exercise. Uh, and we negotiated, as I say, over a draft, uh, a, a draft that took two years to bring close to completion, and we then flew over to Jakarta in Indonesia uh, for the last three days of intensive uh, uh, engagement with each other to come up with a final draft. Uh, I'll never forget those three days. Uh, we were in a very beautiful hotel in that wonderful city. If you haven't been, go. It's a fantastic place. Um, uh, but we never saw it. But I, I say it's fantastic as a matter of theory. I was told it was fantastic. Um, I, I was also told that our hotel had a wonderful swimming pool, spa. Uh, I never got to see them. It was incredibly hard work, but also amazingly rewarding. What I remember from the three days are, in the first place, a sense of excitement and expectation that we were doing something which on the one hand should have been obvious and straightforward, but on the other hand was likely to be groundbreaking. Um, but second, there was a very interesting hesitation uh, um, at the meeting in Jakarta on the part of seasoned, uh, battle-weary LGBTI activists who said to us, the human rights types, who said, go easy, don't call for too much, don't expect too much. Don't make too many claims. Uh, we've had too long a story of being rejected, uh, being shoved uh, outside the room, um, uh, outside the protective space. So be modest in your ambition. And we, the human rights crowd, were saying, oh, don't be daft. The human rights law is so clear here. Let's just push and demand exactly what you're entitled to. So that was a tension that, 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 that we had right through the exercise. Um, and another curious thing we had through the exercise, well, not curious, quite understandable, actually, was a deep sense of disappointment uh, in the limits we set ourselves, which was that we were never going to go beyond the law. We weren't going to create new rights or purport to create new rights. We were going to identify, as I said earlier, how existing human rights applies to the very varied negative experience of people across the world. And this inevitably set up some disappointments in terms of things we chose not to do. I'll come back to an example in a moment. And um, the final comment I'd make, which I don't think compromised the ultimate text, but certainly a feature of our meeting, was the extent to which many of us simply didn't get trans issues. Um, and, and, and as a result, we really had to struggle hard, and the trans activists who were with us had to work very hard uh, to help us understand the complexity of the issues, uh, the ethical, the moral, the legal uh, uh, complexities and minefields uh, within which we were trading. And as I say, I think we got through that okay uh, in the end, but only with hard work on everybody's part. The, um, so what was the outcome? What's in the Jakarta principles? Well, the first thing isn't in the principles at all, and it, but it turned out to be more useful than we could ever have expected, and that is that we, we purported, we sought to define the two key terms sexual orientation and gender identity. Everything here is constructed around these constructs, sexual orientation and gender identity. I, I've spoken <coughs> throughout my talk this evening about sexual minorities, uh, and that's simply because it's, e it's easier to say and quicker to say. Uh, but, but the whole framework for our analysis was around these two terms. But for that purpose, we needed to define them. Because uh, at least until then, uh, when you uh, uh, looked into their content and meaning, uh, it was, a, it was it was different in every source you went to. And we needed to come up with some shared understanding. And so we define them as follows. And this is the only quote I'll give you all night, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, sexual orientation is understood to refer to each person's capacity for profound emotional, affectional, and sexual attraction to and intimate and sexual relations with individuals of different gender or the same gender or more, more than one gender. And then gender identity. 
Gender identity is understood to refer to each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth, including the personal sense of the body and other expressions of gender, including dress, speech, and mannerisms. Now, I don't want to dissect that definition excessively this evening, but just to um, express my own surprise at the extent to which it has been accepted subsequently as the, the, the core agreed language around what these terms mean. There's also, by the way, this is my first chance to say this, and it's nice to do it in Australia, there's a, an Australian angle to the definitions, uh, which isn't captured in the literature, uh, but just as Michael Kirby was still a serving judge at the time the principles were being drafted, he didn't, for that reason, think it appropriate to be a signatory to the principles. He was approached, but he gave some backroom advice. <laughs> And um, the, there's two really important words in these definitions, which are Kirby's. Um, the, um, the words in the sexual orientation uh, definition, which refer to the emotional, affectional, and sexual attraction as needing to be profound. The word profound is there because of Kirby. And then when it comes to gender identity, um, uh, with regard to the, the person's felt internal and individual experience of gender, it's because of him that we have inserted the words deeply felt experience. It's not just felt experience, but deeply. So this quality of profundity uh, of, 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 of your sense of orientation or, or identity, which I think is important and valuable, is entirely thanks to him. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. Well, he's, ret he's retired now, so I suppose it's okay. Um, the Coming on then to the 29 uh, principles, they don't look anything unlike what you find in the treaties. Uh, as I said, they reflect the law. They were meant to look like the human rights treaties. What is different, though, is the order. There was a very deliberate effort made to write this document in terms of the hierarchy of problems confronted by people across the world. And so therefore, it comes as no surprise to you uh, that the very first human right addressed in the Georgia Carter principles is the right to life, the second is the right to, uh, your, to choice of your own identity, and the right to have a, an identity in society, and then the third has to do with discrimination. They don't purport to change the, the content of rights, but they do say a lot about the experience globally. Um, all 29 principles then are addressed to states. They're mainly speaking to governments. Um, and uh, they are speaking to governments as to duty bearers in international human rights law across, across the breadth of the duty. And that's why, with regard to every single human right uh, in the principles, uh, there is an acknowledgement of the state's duty to respect your human rights, to protect your human rights, and to fulfill your human rights. And that's drilled down into some very specific language around what this respect, protect, fulfill uh, obligation looks like when it comes to health care social welfare, expression, um, uh, what, uh, protection from torture, whatever else it might be. Uh, in terms of expressing those rights, as I said earlier, and as was necessary for the exercise, most of what's in here is, as a matter of law, pretty non-controversial. But there is one provision which triggered an awful lot of attention and controversy, and it's still problematic today. And that is the principle that relates to issues of marriage. The Judge Carter principles do not call for marriage equality as a matter of human rights. It was felt at that time, six years ago, that the international practice wasn't ready yet. And the most that the principles could say was that if um, marriage was recognized for same-sex couples, then it must be on the same terms as for other sex couples. Um, I wonder, were we too timid there? I, I, I was happy enough with where we were for quite a while, but in the context of the marriage equality debates that are happening in my country, uh, I guess here and in a number of other countries right now, I'm, I'm, fine, I'm rethinking. Uh, and we have Paula Gerber, where's Paula? She's here, isn't she? There you are. And I have Paula Gerber to blame for completely undermining me uh, when I read a really great piece she wrote, just read it a few days ago, which more or less convinced me uh, that uh, you can it's a perfectly legitimate exercise of international law make a case for marriage equality today. So perhaps that's the one principle of Dr. Jakarta that, that could do with a bit of, uh, of a freshening up. Um, so that's what's in the Dr. Jakarta principles. And then there's the question, well, what happened? 
Uh, what impact did this exercise have? Was it, as so often is the case, just another expensive talking shop with people uh, doing uh, excessive carbon emissions to come together in nice places uh, to develop a document that nobody will read? Uh, is that what these principles are? <laughs> is this poor old Flaherty trying out this lame old document every opportunity he can to bored and jaded audiences? Um, well, actually, the answer to that, I'm very happy to say, is no. Um, the impact has been interesting, and I would even say astonishing. Firstly, it was the limited scope of the ambition of the exercise. The ambition of this exercise was to relocate LGBTI discussion uh, within the framework of human rights. Uh, and there, I would argue, absolutely, uh, that has been achieved. Now, OK, the producer of the news program in Belfast, who was playing, running this label underneath my name, may not quite have gotten the point. But in serious mainstream human rights discourse now, uh, I don't think there's any argument uh, uh, anymore as to the extent to which human rights must speak to these situations. So within the, 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 the task that Dr. Carter had set itself, uh, nobody, I think, disputes today that the goal was achieved. Um, the impact, though, has been way more than that. And that's why I speak of a startling uh, and even an astonishing um, uh, uh, outcome. Uh, the second uh, notable achievement out of the uh, Dr. Carter principles is the one I mentioned earlier, but, but which must be mentioned again in this list, uh, of the acceptance of the definitions. Um, uh, if you look at any United Nations, and we'll come back to this, if you look at any United Nations instrument that speaks to matters of sexual orientation or gender identity and purports to define them, well, lo and behold, it uses the Dr. Carter definition. And right through the literature, uh, you will increasingly find that. In the early days, there were attempts by some, and this is perfectly legitimate, to dispute the definitions. But I don't see so much of that uh, in the material that's been produced in the last couple of years. The, the third outcome, which we didn't quite expect, we probably hoped for it, but we didn't expect it to the extent we encountered it, was the manner by which the Dr. Carter principles have become a platform for advocacy. They've become a framework in which people can claim their rights. Uh, and um, civil society groups <coughs> across the world have said that they provided a platform, a framework, a context which has made their own work to achieve justice much more coherent and, and even more effective. And there, in fact, what's happening is a phenomenon that we found across all manner of sectors over time. Uh, children's advocacy uh, improved exponentially when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted, disability activists will tell us today that their activism has become more effective because of the disability treaty. And again, we're hearing the same thing with regard to the relationship of the principles uh, to activism in the um, sexual orientation, gender identity area. Um, advocacy is only effective if it changes things on the ground. And that's the next point uh, worth recalling. And that is the extent to which states and regions within states, and indeed cities, have adopted the principles, hooks, line, and sinker, as statements of their policy position on the issues. And the first country to do this was the Netherlands. The Netherlands uh, turned up at the United Nations General Assembly and said that our foreign policy, as the Netherlands, is the Dr. Carter principles. That's a remarkable uh, thing to say. Uh, and that's been followed by a number of other countries, including my own. Uh, Ireland and the Human Rights Council of the UN made more or less exactly the same statement a few years ago. Uh, and uh, as I say, this embracing by states as a matter of policy um, uh, it, it has been also replicated at the level of cities. There are a number of cities across the world that have said that these represent their values of what they intend to uh, defend and uphold within their own municipalities. Um, Moving beyond states, there have been a few remarkable develops at the, uh, developments at the interstate regional level. Time not being with me, I'll just mention one, which is arguably the most important. And that is that the Council of Europe adopted one of its own legislative instruments entirely on the basis of the Dr. Carter principles. Now, these instruments of the Council of Europe are rather tamely called recommendations. It sounds like very little. Uh, but they are the nearest thing to normative expressions that the member states of the Council of Europe uh, reach uh, in their work. Uh, and um, in the context of the Council, it's remarkably important because the Council includes a number of uh, states of Europe which are very problematic 
from the point of view of LGBTI rights, as such as the Russian Federation. And so having this Council of Europe recommendation does indeed make a difference. Um, moving on then to the level of courts, there's been a, a very interesting and encouraging jurisprudential take-up of the Georgia Carta principles uh, across very many countries. Um, the most famous judgment uh, is a judgment of the Delhi High Court striking down criminalization of same-sex sexual activity, which devotes, doesn't just make reference, but devotes pages to the Georgia Carta principles. And also, by the way, pays the ultimate compliment to an academic where it actually um, writes quite nicely about the principles and quotes the principles, and then continues on. And as I read it, I thought that's awfully familiar. Uh, and it was an article of mine. Uh, and um, you know, anybody who plagiarized, who plagiarized by a high court. <laughs> the, um, now, 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 those of you who know the Delhi High Court story knows it didn't end well. Uh, when, when the case reached the Indian Supreme Court, it was struck down. It was struck down on a technicality. Uh, and the Indian Supreme Court took the occasion in a later case to say to the Indian government, uh, you might want to look at decriminalization. Uh, so uh, I, 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 in no way would I, uh, it's my view that in no way was the use of the principles by the Delhi court in any way undermined by what happened at the higher instance. Um, we find the principles pleaded extensively across the world. This is a different, difficult thing to, to map, of course, because pleadings aren't always captured in the published um, uh, judgments. Uh, but um, it's certainly in my own personal experience in Northern Ireland, uh, I encountered the principles pleaded on at least four occasions during my time there, uh, including in cases which we took as the Human Rights Commission around the context of um, the um, entitlement of same-sex couples to be considered as possible adoptive parents, while always protecting the principle of the best interests of the child. The, um, let me just uh, finish this jurisprudential dimension uh, by, by referring also to the extent to which the United Nations human rights treaty bodies have taken up the, 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 the values, the qualities, the, the material uh, contained in the Georgia part of the principles. Um, the first of the treaty bodies to do it, which I, I find unfortunate because it wasn't the treaty body of which I, I am a me was a member, was the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights which uh, 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 did exactly what I mentioned earlier. It took the definitions of sexual orientation and gender identity, lifted them from the Georgia Carter principles, and then applied them across uh, all of its work. Uh, and then a few years later, the Human Rights Committee, somewhat grudgingly, a story I don't really have time to go into, but somewhat grudgingly uh, came to embrace uh, the qualities of the principles. The Human Rights Committee is, is a type of body that will never, never give credit to anything else for its <laughs> achievements. And so it doesn't cite the principles, but you can bet that they massively inform some of its recent work, including the last case with which I was involved before I left the committee called Fedotova versus the Russian Federation. It was the last case for which I was rapporteur. Uh, and I'm thrilled with that case because it was a case about a woman um, uh, uh, with a placard in Moscow uh, is simply saying, I'm a lesbian, ask me about it. That's what her placard, placard said. Uh, she did it quite close to a school. Um, um, uh, and she fell foul of, uh, of municipal laws, uh, went, went through the system, no redress. The case finally found its way to us. And we had to determine what form of a human rights violation there was in this case. Now, there was clearly a violation of her freedom of expression rights, but we were able to get language into that judgment, which freed finally in human rights committee practice, which freed uh, LGBTI issues from these narrow boxes of discrimination and privacy by allowing us to say that this woman had her rights violated simply because she was declaring who she was as a lesbian woman. Uh, and again, that might sound especially thrilling, but it was a landmark, I would suggest, in terms of what the human rights committee uh, has achieved in this area. And, um, and finally, uh, in terms of the impact of the principles, I'd have to, in a shockingly summary fashion, uh, refer to the manner in which they have informed the quite startling and dramatic developments around the issues in the political human rights body of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, and in the work of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and her office, uh, the so-called OHCHR. Five years ago, uh, there wasn't much at all happening 
in either the Council or OHCHR around the issues I'm talking to you about tonight. Um, the efforts to raise LGBTI issues in the Council had died a death. Brazil had been its champion for a number of years, but it had petered out uh, in a context of massive resistance. Uh, and, the, and, and the subject was, quite frankly, toxic in the High Commissioner's office. Uh, nobody would, under any circumstances, take any initiatives around these matters. So five years ago, the UN, in this sense, this dimension, was in a very bad place. And a number of diplomats in Geneva were determined on the basis of the principles and what they represented uh, to kickstart efforts again uh, at, at bringing these issues onto that, that, that key human rights table uh, of the world. Uh, and um, so they, they, they did what you always do in Geneva, to try and kickstart something. They convened a, a panel, a side <laughs> event. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, they convened a panel uh, at the Palais des Nations in Geneva, and I had the great honor of being one of the panelists. But we were led on that panel by the then pretty newly appointed High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, who just stepped down a few weeks ago, a South African lawyer. And uh, we didn't really know what Navi Pillay was going to do on this issue. We did know that senior officials in her office had, had tried hard to get her not to go on the panel. So that was encouraging that she was there despite that. But we weren't at all sure. And just imagine our astonishment when Pele then uh, took the microphone and just did a tour de force uh, on the extent to which these issues are issues of human rights and need to be at the center of the UN's agenda. And with that remarkable presentation on that day, she, and I would in large part say she, kick-started uh, this, this, this re-engagement uh, at the United Nations. Uh, and very quickly, by the way, she somehow managed to persuade the UN Secretary General to join her. And Ban Ki-moon has been no less direct and straightforward in, in, in the leadership that he's shown. In any case, in the context of the efforts of, 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 the, of diplomats, the leadership shown by High Commissioner Navi Pillay and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, we've had a reawakening at the Human Rights Council and in the work of OHCHR, which is truly remarkable and very important. Um, it has already resulted in two resolutions um, of the Council uh, and the production of one groundbreaking report and another one currently in production. Again, that may not sound like much. That might sound like so much process far away. But these are exactly the steps one takes, the building blocks one constructs uh, towards serious development of serious new tools for human rights protection. And in that regard, I believe we're on a, we're on a pathway now, uh, I would hope an unstoppable one, to the appointment quite soon of a, a UN human rights monitor focusing exclusively on LGBTI issues. It's called a UN Special Rapporteur. And again, historically, it's been proven on issue after issue that the appointment of a rapporteur and the, appoint the creation of the mandate of a rapporteur and the appointment of a good person to do that job uh, can, can, can quite dramatically improve the protective space around whatever the issue might be. Um, I mentioned that there was a recent resolution, a second resolution, uh, which called for a new report uh, of the UN around the issues of LGBTI protection. Uh, and that report is currently in development. And it will focus on good practice worldwide uh, to protect uh, the human rights of LGBTI persons. And, uh, I have the great good fortune of being involved in the, uh, the research that will underpin uh, the content of that research. And um, we're still in very early days, but tonight I want to share with you some extremely preliminary findings, um, uh, which, which, which uh, I find interesting and noteworthy and which I suspect will necessarily find their way into the ultimate report that will be produced by the UN next year. Uh, let me be a bit local to start with making a few points. And the first point I would make is that Australia is looking very good. Um, you know, there, there does appear to be some quite interesting internationally relevant good practice in Australia which will need to be taken account of in the report. Uh, I, I point out, for example, your nat national action plan uh, which addresses such issues overlooked in other countries as suicide prevention, care for LGBTI elderly people, specific issues that arise there, uh, the need to mainstream understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity and education, the appointment of LGBTI liaison officers in your police forces. Again, these are all notable uh, and to be commended. Moving 
beyond Australia, um, it's interesting the extent to which the good practices, uh, many come from the developed world, the global north, or whatever one wants to call it, uh, but, but the, um, that's not by any means exclusive. We find them from right across all of the regions. Latin America, in particular, stands out as quite remarkable. Uh, for example, in Argentina, uh, we have uh, one of the most liberal gender identity laws in the world, where you simply self-identify no need for surgery, no need for the hoops and the, um, the, the, the labyrinthine process that's required in so many other states. And again, Argentina, clearly an international best practice. Cuba, who would have thought it? Cuba, um, a, 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 a country which also delivers some really interesting positive messages. Fidel Castro has apologized and made an act of apology on behalf of the state uh, for decades of LGBTI repression and um, a, a government-funded uh, institution called the National Center for Sex Education is doing groundbreaking work on changing attitudes in Cuban society. Um, moving to another part of the world, Nepal, um, uh, very impressive anti-discrimination laws in, in, engaging the LGBTI dimension. And Nepal's National Human Rights Institution, the Human Rights Commission, uh, has developed an action plan which puts LGBTI issues uh, at the very heart of its program. Um, just by way of a couple more examples before I finish up, um, there's some curiosities I, I, I thought to share with you tonight. Um, and one is that we've encountered a couple of countries that have strong anti-discrimination laws embracing LGBTI, but which at the same time maintain their criminalization laws with regard to same-sex sexual activity. Uh, one such country is Botswana. Um, on that issue of criminalization, has some interesting developments. Again, back to your region, Palau has recently decriminalized same-sex sexual activity and has, in so doing, has cited the recommendations it received from the United Nations. Um, where the criminalization laws remain in place, uh, we're finding a number of countries which are resigning from the application of the laws, are making clear that while they remain on the statute books, they have no intention of applying them. And one such country is Mozambique, which has made that statement. Uh, and uh, we also find in countries which maintain the laws uh, a number of instances of the courts saying to the state, we don't like this law, you need to look at it. Uh, it's, it's high time we went about changing it rather than enforcing it. And that is, if I may, in, a, in, a, in, a, in summary, uh, that captures the spirit of the Indian Supreme Court. And we find something similar from the High Court of Malawi. So that's where we are right now. And um, in terms of, uh, of practice, uh, hopefully some promising practice emerging globally. And let me conclude with a few thoughts on where we'll go from here. Um, and in doing so, I'd like to focus in particular, because we don't have time. Uh, I don't want to give you a global master plan. It's very boring and rather obvious, too. Uh, but I'd like to just mention a few specific actors that I think have a critically important role to play as we move to the next chapter of this story. Uh, and the first actor, and with that, without doubt I would suggest the most important, is the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights. And I mention that because we no longer have Navi Pillay. We have a new High Commissioner uh, as of uh, September, uh, Prince Said from Jordan. Uh, and we will really need to look to him to provide the same spirited, informed, and engaged, persistent leadership uh, uh, that was delivered by his predecessor. And I'd have to say here that I'm not discouraged by anything I've seen yet. Um, the, um, it's interesting, the, uh, his opening speech uh, on taking up his appointment was circulated by his office a few days before he delivered it, and it had no references whatsoever to the issues we're talking about tonight. Uh, but the speech that the man actually delivered in the very second paragraph makes reference to the unacceptability of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Some have said, that's mean and not enough. Uh, I would say, that's fine. That's a, as good an indication as I need in the man's first speech uh, that, that he'll, he'll, he'll stay focused on these issues. So we need his leadership. Uh, we've yet to see him demonstrate it. Uh, but as I say, I'm not especially concerned uh, just now. Secondly, we need the persistent engagement on these issues of civil society. It is critically important, time and time again, the changes, the improvements, the good practices have been because of the persistent work of civil society. Uh, it's, it's a work at every imaginable level. It's work at the international level. 
In large part, the UN is moving at the pace it is right now because the human rights NGOs won't let it off the hook. Um, it's work they're doing back home. States are taking positions, changing positions, making statements um, uh, on the international stage, in large part because they're being lobbied heavy and hard uh, by their own civil society organizations back home. Uh, that is in large part, for example, why South Africa has, has stayed more or less engaged uh, around these campaigns in recent years. It's because it isn't being let off the hook, I would argue, by its own civil society. Um, the third actor that I, I think it's important to mention this evening is the na is national human rights institutions, human rights commissions. Um, they, the work they could do in this area is very much in the potential rather than the actuality. Now, we, interestingly here, uh, the exception, the exceptions are in this part of the world, where your human rights commission has done good work on this, the New Zealand commission has done great work, and the consortium of national human rights institutions for the Asia Pacific uh, has adopted a very good, clear policy, uh, based uh, quite directly on the Jogjakarta principles. Um, but this is the only region in which we see that level of engagement, energy, and attention. And we need to see it uh, worked out uh, through the, the other consortia around the world. Um, business, uh, the business sector is, yes, it's the last actor I want to mention, because again here I think we're only now beginning to talk of the extent to which we need leadership from business and the business sector uh, to make meaningful change around the promotion and protection of LGBTI rights. Uh, and it's the, the action required from business is on many levels. In the first place, it's just the obvious stuff about good practice, leadership, and presenting role models. We saw that from Silicon Valley recently. Um, I understand there are a few important corporations here in Australia which are led by uh, people belonging to LGBTI communities. Uh, and this is obvious and good and valuable, but today I'd rather focus on another dimension, which is on the extent to which we increasingly understand that human rights, that business rather, must be human rights compliant. And it's in the space of reflecting on what it means to be human rights compliant on the part of the private sector that we can achieve quite a lot around the promotion and protection of the rights of the LGBTI communities. Um, as you know, uh, there is a, a framework in place today adopted by the UN on human rights and business. It's colloquially known as the Ruggie <coughs> Principles, after John Ruggie, the, uh, the expert appointed by the UN to develop the document. And um, in countries across the world, uh, national action plans are being drawn up right now to, in, to localize and to implement the Ruggie Principles uh, for each, uh, each country. Uh, just before I came here, I attended the first meeting on a national action plan for Ireland. And there are four or five other European countries that have already adopted one. I was disappointed to be told this week that there's no discernible move to develop a, a, a human rights and business action plan yet in Australia. Uh, that seems to me to be a bit of a deficiency, a bit of a gap, uh, well beyond the issues we're talking about tonight. But if and when uh, you succeed in getting it on the Australian agenda, then do make sure to integrate the LGBTI dimension uh, into its formulation. And let me finish uh, by mentioning the one recommendation that I have no intention of making. Uh, and I mention it because it gets a lot of mentions. And that is this idea that what we need now is a treaty to protect LGBTI people. We need a dedicated, focused treaty on the issue. I think that's a really bad idea for a thousand reasons. Um, not least that once we allow uh, diplomats to get their hands on the negotiation of the space for the human rights of LGBTI people, I think there's every possibility that we'll go backwards rather than forwards. And worse, we'll end up with a treaty ratified by the developed world and largely neglected by the developing world. And I don't think that's helpful for the rights or for good, vigorous, healthy uh, treaty law. Instead, what I would suggest to you, and it comes no surprise after what I've been ranting on about all evening, um, I would suggest to you that instead of a new treaty, we just need to go back to the John Jakarta principles, uh, to, to use them as a framework with plenty of vigor and life left in them yet. Uh, a template uh, and, and, and a context in which we can um, persistently and with increasing impact and effect hold our states to account on what are, after all, just basic human rights. Thank you.
uh, level of applause says it all. Your, your talk was very well received. I must um, apologise for missing the uh, first part. Who would have thought it would take an hour and a half to get from Clayton to the city? But uh, Monash Freeway is a car park uh, this evening. Um, I would just like to say that um, I can assure you Michael Kirby um, loves being spoken about <laughs> with you uh, giving him credit for some words in the Job Jakarta principles. So I believe you are willing to um, take a few questions and continue the discussion for a while. So um, if anyone would like to kick start with the question, yes, Adam. Hi, uh, thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I had a question about um, thing, uh, how things went on the Human Arts Committee. So I was interested whether you found um, any pockets of resistance among your colleagues on the committee? And if so, what do you think was behind those pockets of resistance? And if those people moved over time, what do you thought it was that made them move? Yeah, there's certainly been a change in the um, Human Rights Committee, uh, but it's not exclusively a change that is the function of the attitudes of committee members. Uh, it is also a function of the kinds of issues, cases, problems that are brought to the committee, uh, by whether that be by NGOs in the re report review procedure uh, or by um, individuals through the individual communication procedure. So um, and my point here is it isn't necessarily because of bad committee members that things don't happen. Uh, the, the, the committees are very reactive to material that's put in front of them. Uh, that said, of course, uh, there have been changes in the composition of the committees, uh, and um, uh, with those changes, uh, a number of people who were quite vigorously opposed to these issues as essentially reading of Western values into global instruments, uh, uh, that, that voice has become much less prominent. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, it would have been the case even six, seven years ago that any matter of um, protecting the rights of LGBTI people, even basic issues of privacy and non-discrimination long since established in the case law, would have to be fought long and hard within the closed sessions of the committee uh, before one could reach a reasonable outcome. Um, uh, and um, my final observation would be that that would in part have been a function not just of some personal resistance, but also of the quite understandable extent to which people tend to reflect the cultures from which they come. Um, but, uh, but I do see a remarkable change in recent years, and I've even seen in recent years a willingness by people who come from cultures that would apparently, apparently, because one should be very careful raising the culture argument, but apparently opposed, uh, that uh, such people have been willing to, uh, to uh, accept positions which would a few years ago be seen as very surprising. so I might ask a question. Um, how concerning do you think the resolution of the Human Rights Council on uh, the family, as in the singular nuclear family, is for uh, the LGBTI community and its radical rights? <laughs> <laughs> getting a lot of exercise here. Um, the, the, yes, I suppose that's the obvious thing to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, every, every community has problem solvers and, uh, <laughs> and technology deniers. <laughs> um, the the um, uh, yeah, it's a problem. Of course, it is. Uh, the the resolution on the family has been overtaken by some states uh, as a as a as a sort of a countering initiative uh, to head off uh, uh, developments which are being achieved through the. Uh, the, the sexual orientation resolution. Um, and we're just going to have to see how that plays out over time. Um, but what is critically important is to proceed in as non-confrontational a way as, as possible. It's very important that uh, sexual orientation, gender identity work be seen as a battle to be won or lost over and above and against certain states. Because that's just going to further compound the polarization, which will, 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 will make the future even harder to negotiate. Yes. Um, sorry, um, what are some of the greatest obstacles in overcoming a wider use of the Yogyakarta principles today? Uh, for example, does religion uh, factor into a reluctance to achieve the principles, or are there any other such factors? Sure. Um, well, I think the, um, the biggest problems are misinformation and um, the challenge of translating the principles 
into language that's accessible uh, uh, across LGBTI activist communities. Uh, firstly, misinformation. Uh, in the early days, less now, but it's still happening, some remarkably mischievous uh, um, uh, material spread around the world, suggesting that the Dr. Carthy principles do all manner of things that they don't claim to do. Create new law, create new standards, uh, set children up for abuse, I mean, you name it. I mean, it's quite predictable stuff, uh, but it got wide currency, and it's still referred to by people, including people, I would say, of goodwill, um, uh, uh, as a reason to reject the Dr. Carthy principles. Um, the issue of comprehension has, 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 has been a, a major one, to, to an extent that surprised me, if I could be anecdotal, I, I was asked years ago, before I ever went to Northern Ireland as Chief Commissioner, I was asked to go to Belfast and speak to a, an LGBTI activist group about the principles. Um, and these were frontline activists, not a lawyer in the house. And um, for some reason, I was asked to give this presentation in the context of a social event, a party with lots of wine. <laughs> and, and for some further reason, I was only actually asked to take the floor at 11 o'clock that evening. <laughs> and it was the worst 10 minutes of my life. I, was, I thought I was giving a reasonably comprehensive, quite accessible presentation. And nobody, the people just were so uninterested. And eventually a woman interrupted me and she said, that is the greatest load of blather I ever heard. What's that going to do to improve the rights of my sisters on the streets of Derry tomorrow? You know, and, 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 and the point was, and I probably haven't put it terribly well, that they need to, they're, 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 this is a document that was written to states about their responsibilities, and it's got to be interpreted uh, out to the various communities that want to work with it and engage it, and that's an exercise that needs to continue. There's been some work done, but probably not enough. So they've had just two elements uh, of, of, of maybe the next stage. Okay. Thank you. A microphone, um, how can the Western world take responsibility for the imposition of punitive measures uh, for same-sex sexual activities um, in many developing countries in light of the fact that um, a huge proportion of these countries are actually being colonised in the past? Yeah, yeah. Queen Victoria has a lot to answer for. Yeah. Um, I mean, my country, this country, Lord knows how many others have criminalised same-sex sexual activity on the basis of uh, uh, offences against the Person Act. Is it 1864 or something like that? Um, so it's a, it's a very reasonable point. Um, it's, yes, I, I agree with you. There is, in a sense, an ethical responsibility uh, of, of, of the, those states that exported these practices uh, to work towards um, uh, addressing them right now. Um, but in a manner that isn't excessively adversarial, uh, doesn't further polarize, and doesn't uh, it, it, further exacerbate a sense that LGBTI rights are Western rights. These are all risks uh, along that pathway. But managing those risks, there has got to be important work to be done within development assistance uh, programming. Um, a number of countries have put promotion of LGBTI rights at the very heart of their, um, their development programming. Germany, I think, is one. There are a number of others. Uh, and again, if handled respectfully but persistently in that context, I think good, 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 good work could be done. Yes, sounds like that. No, my phone's not working, so <laughs> just project your voice. Um, I think the ICCPR is a waste of time in terms of getting through these principles with uh, LGBTI because um, marriage is defined as being between a man and a woman and um, you have to resort to confidentiality of your privacy rather than facing the main issue of whether it's a uh, basic human right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well the first thing is of course protection of rights of LGBTI people needs to go way beyond civil and political rights. It's also about socioeconomic rights, it's the rights of the child, um, uh, gender discrimination, uh, disability rights. It, it's, it's way more than the human rights contained in ICCPR. But turning to the ICCPR rights, the rights in the covenant of civil and political rights, no, I don't believe it's a waste of time. Um, it, 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 in a way, I suppose everything I was saying tonight was the extent to which every right in ICCPR must have something meaningful to say 
to people who belong to sexual minorities. And we are beginning to see it being said. And that's why this Fedotoba case matters so much. Uh, because uh, it, it is that moment where, uh, it, it, in I think its most significant fashion as of yet, at least until then, uh, the Human Rights Committee was able to get outside the dis anti-discrimination privacy boxes and speak about things like identity, uh, using language which it had rarely ever used uh, in the past. And that, I think, suggested to us the possibilities for tomorrow. Um, and on the marriage issue, as I said, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the um, Article 24 uh, is quite clear. Uh, uh, it, it appears to be quite clear about marriage being uh, a, a matter of men and women. Uh, and it has been interpreted as meaning with that language that it's a, it's a right of men to women and women to men, and not men, men, women, women, or whatever else it might be. Um, and the European Court of Human Rights uh, seems to relish taking every possible opportunity to say, say the same, even when it doesn't need to say it, because the case in front of it has nothing to do with it. But nevertheless, you know, an argument is being made, uh, Paula, Paula has made it very effectively recently, uh, that we should be looking at those issues again. And uh, I think your argument is that if we use a non-discrimination approach, we may be able to overcome the problems that are apparently presented by the language of the, um, the marriage provisions themselves. Yes, and I think that's absolutely right. It's using non-discrimination provisions, but also um, doing a modern interpretation of Article 23, but at the same time looking at the, the, the drafting history. Um, because when Article 23 was drafted and, and it said a man and a woman, it, no one was thinking about same-sex marriage. People were thinking about creating equal rights for women, that, that it was on, wasn't just men that had the right the rights in a marriage. So that language was very specific to that context and had nothing to do with same-sex marriage. So the, the um, argument that I've made, which is coming out in the next issue of the Sydney Law Review, if anyone's inclined to read it, um, <laughs> is that we, we read, need to reinterpret Article 23 and that the Jocelyn decision um, is, should not be held as good law today. And also, unfortunately, I think that case was, the timing of it was very bad. At the time that the Jocelyn decision uh, Jocelyn claim went to the Human Rights Committee, there was only one country in the world that allowed um, same-sex couples to marry. So it was probably premature and perhaps um, re-looking at it in, in coming years we might get a different um, outcome. We, uh, one more question. Lucky last. Hi. How do you see the inclusion of intersex and the public principles considering that its gender identity is quite different to intersex? Well, you could equally have said, why include gender identity with sexual orientation? And uh, some activists would still say that the throwing of all these things together isn't helping in the areas of gender identity and intersex. Um, and and uh, I, I think they, you know, they make a reasonable case. Um, but I, that boat has sailed. <laughs> um, uh, intersex is there, probably adequate to the purpose at the time, but our general understanding around issues of intersex has grown enormously in, 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 in subsequent years. And perhaps, the, you know, one could say the gender identity and intersex dimensions of the judge party principles need, need, need a revision or a, a fresh look. But I, I, uh, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that the references are there, albeit I'm not sure we quite understood what we were doing with the references, and we've come to with much more focus today. Well, I think you realise what a, a privilege it has been to have uh, Michael address us this evening. It's not often that uh, uh, such an esteemed uh, human rights expert is willing to make the long haul flight to Australia to share his uh, his insight with us. So please join me one more time in thanking. <laughs>